Hey everyone, Bishop here. We're launching this brand new sermon series called I Vision. You know, I Vision is about seeing ourselves the way that God sees us. And over the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, so many of us have suffered so much and we fail to see ourselves the way that God sees us. And in this sermon series, we're going to show you and encourage you to let you know that you were worth dying for and Christ loves you and he died for you. I want you to do us a big favor and I want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have never done that before. I want you to hit the bell so that you can be notified every time we go live. And also, don't forget to like our page. We love you and appreciate you so, so much. And we can't wait for you to come in person and to be in the house with us. But if not, make sure that you're watching us online. Don't miss any of the sermons in this new sermon series called I Vision. Don't forget, the Bishop of First Lady loves you very, very much. And we can't wait to see you. God bless you. Have a great day. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm so looking forward to, to, to next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to be open for in-person gatherings. So we're just waiting to receive you next week. We look forward to that. Today, today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm beginning this new sermon series entitled, I Vision. I Vision. I want you to write that in the chat right now, just the, 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 the letter I and vision, okay? And I know, I know, I know, what is I Vision? And I know it sounds a little bit strange to call a sermon, or maybe I should say it's a lot strange to have a sermon title that says I Vision. And what does that mean? Now, I want you to get uh, our purpose for this sermon series. The end goal for this sermon series is actually to discover two things. Number one, we need to discover how to have a healthy view of who we are and our purpose. A healthy view of who we are and our purpose. Number two, number two, we need to discover how to see ourselves the way that God sees us. The way that God sees us. Family, it is said that humanity... All of humanity longs to answer five of life's most essential questions. And the five questions are, who am I? Where did I come from? What am I here for? How do I do it? And where am I going? Now, these questions cannot be answered correctly unless we know who we are and who God is. Until we recognize who we are, we cannot see who God is. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. God saw us worth the death of his only begotten son on the cross. Now, anybody that's willing to die for somebody means that you must or that person must be worth a lot. If you know that, if you've been attending RC for a while, you know that I love going to the movies. I enjoy that. And sometimes, some, sometimes, especially over the last two years, it's been very difficult for us here in Canada to go and enjoy any movies because of the pandemic. But there was a time a few years ago that I went to see a movie that was actually playing in 3D. Now, seeing a 3D or even better, a 4D movie, movie is so much fun. But this particular time, I forgot on the way into the theater to pick up my 3D movie glasses. 
And probably the reason why I forgot on my way into the theater to grab my 3D glasses was I was concentrating on my popcorn to get to my seat so I can eat it. Because I don't know if anybody else has this issue or not, but oftentimes if, I, if I'm a little bit early to the movie, I eat my popcorn even before the movie starts. I'm sure I'm not the only one that happens to. But anyway... In this particular time, once the movie started, I realized that I couldn't see clearly. And all of a sudden, I realized that the picture was so fuzzy, and the reason why it was fuzzy is because, or the movie, or the movie is distorted, was because I forgot my 3D glasses. So what I had to do was, in order to see properly, in order to see what the creators of the movie had in mind, I had to run back out to get my 3D glasses. Now, without my glasses, my 3D glasses, my vision was, since, was seriously impaired, and no matter how hard I strained to see the movie clearly, I couldn't see it because I was trying to see a dimension that my eyesight was not capable of seeing. Are you following me so far? Now, by putting on my 3D glasses, and I should have brought a pair of 3D glasses to give you this illustration, but when I put on my 3D glasses, I could actually see what the creator of the movie wanted me to see without distortion. Now, like trying to watch a 3D, mo a 3D movie without the proper 3D glasses, many of us are trying to live our lives looking through the, through the wrong lenses. Oftentimes, ladies and gentlemen, we get duped into trying to live our lives without seeing all there is to see. Without my 3D glasses, I could not experience and enjoy the movie because I couldn't see clearly. If all you see is the physical, the visible scenarios, then you're not seeing the true picture that the creator had in mind and what he wants you to see. That's why... You and I both need to have a divine frame of reference, a frame of reference, in order to see truly what is going on in our lives. Family, I actually hope that, <laughs> this sounds weird, but I, I hope that you can't relate to what I'm about to tell you. But if you're like me, and I got a feeling that most of you are, every single day of my life, I've got to make a decision about whose voice I'm going to listen to and what lens I'm going to view myself through. See, if the enemy can convince you, convince us, to see ourselves through the wrong lens and to listen to our own negative self-talk, he will stop us from becoming the very best God version of ourselves. The fact is this. It's not what you are that's holding you back from discovering the best version of yourself, but it's what you think you are not. How other people see us is not half as important as we see, as important as we see ourselves. See, I want you to listen Listening to and seeing ourselves through the enemy's distorted filter rather than God's filter will slowly but surely erode the image of God from which you and I were formed and fashioned. The enemy of our soul wants to distort and paint your frame of mind in a negative light so you will live in this perpetual toxic cycle of negativity. Living in a perpetual toxic cycle of negativity causes blindness to the human soul 
which distorts the vision and the plan of, for, of, the plan of God for your life from becoming a reality in your life. Family, one of the greatest challenges in life is not overcoming what other people say about us, but rather overcoming what we say and what we believe about ourselves. The greatest threat to, to towards the plan and the purpose of God in our lives is not the hallowed tr threats that come from the, de the, from the demonic realm, but the enemy in the inner me that refuses and tries to block me from following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Family, the greatest weakness of most humans is our inability to view life from God's perspective. See, just imagine how different your life would be if you could see what God sees. Just imagine of the blessings that would come in your life if you could see what God sees. I want you to think about this for a moment. You and I can only see to the corner, but our God sees around the corner. You and I can only see one side of the mountain, but God sees the other side of the mountain. Isn't it a strange thing that we serve this amazing, all-powerful God. We serve the God who stood on, the, on nothing and, and flung the stars against the black velvet of the night. Isn't it amazing that, that we serve a God that created every living, breathing thing, including all of humankind, but we still don't believe what he said in Mark 9, 23, when he said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Family, isn't it strange that we say that we believe in a God who could turn water into wine, who could heal the sick and raise the dead, isn't it strange that we say we believe that he could walk on water, that he could, that he could take money from a fish's mouth, that he could feed over 5,000 people, hungry men and their families, with just two fish and five loaves? Isn't it amazing that we say that our God was so powerful that he could die on a cross and then raise himself back up in three days? Isn't it amazing that we believe and we say that he could do all of these things, but yet so often we fail, we fail to believe that this same God could use you and can use me to do great exploits in his kingdom. Isn't it strange that any time God starts to fulfill your desires, starts to fulfill the dreams that you've had over the years, isn't it amazing that whenever things start to go right in your life, if you're like me, all of a sudden, this inner critic shows up, perches or, perches or lands on our shoulder, and then starts to tell us things like this, you're not smart enough. You don't have the right education or enough education to do that. Isn't it amazing that we hear things like, you don't have the money or the support system to do that. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Does anyone else hear voices that tells them there's no use because nothing ever works right for you? Does anybody else hear the voices like, you don't have the talent, or I'm just not creative. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the knowledge. 
I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too white. I'm too black. I'm too unorganized. Does anyone else hear these voices? Today just isn't my day. I could never afford that. No matter what I do, I could never lose the weight. I will never have a good marriage. No one will ever receive me. No one will ever love me. Does anyone else ever look in the mirror and say to themselves, they're the person that's looking back at them, says something like, I hate you? Things never work out for you? Did anybody else ever hear that image that's looking back at you from the mirror tell you things like, go ahead. The world would be better off without you. Do your family a favor. Take your life. Nobody cares and nobody will miss you. Have anyone else ever heard the voice say, you make me sick. You are absolutely disgusting. Anybody else ever hear the voice say, I never get a break. I never win. Someone always beats me. I'm never enough. Anybody else ever hear that voice say, you deserve the abuse. Everyone leaves you. See, every day we are bombarded with negative thoughts that tries to convince us that we are unlovable, worthless, hopeless, unimportant, despicable, useless, inadequate, unwanted, incompetent, broken beyond repair. And the narrative goes on and on in our heads, playing like a stuck record, stuck on negativity. Family, I'm pretty sure most every person have heard the inner voice, which causes us then to further bury our dreams, hide our hopes, and it distorts our eye vision. And it makes us carry on our lives in a, in a mundane life that's filled with regrets and unfulfilled potential. See, family, recently, the Lord has been speaking to me about the challenges that we are facing uh, and the challenge of seeing what God sees. Seeing ourselves through the eyes of God rather than through the eyes of our pain. God has been talking to me about you. About you becoming the best God version of yourself. He's been talking to me about your eye vision. See, there is a you version of you, but there is a God version of you. And most of the time, there's this huge gap in between the God version of you and the I version of you. And I want to use this sermon series by the help of the Holy Spirit to bridge the gap to close the gap. It's unfortunate, but many people live most of their lives and sometimes their whole life stuck in the you version of themselves without ever realizing and experiencing the God version of themselves. Two versions. Family, never underestimate your ability to underestimate yourself. See, I believe one of the symptoms of having an approaching and nervous breakdown is the belief that your life and your living is insignificant and unimportant. 
The difference between how you see yourself and how God sees you is enough to make most people live in obscurity for their entire lives. God's been talking to me, ladies and gentlemen. God's been talking to me about some of your struggles, about some of your hang-ups, about some of your pain that's causing you to have a distorted, blurred, incorrect vision of who God says you are. So in this sermon series, I'm believing, I'm praying, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help me to become your your spiritual optometrist, your eye vision specialist, your LASIK surgeon, who will help correct and restore your proper eye vision. Now understand, understand, none of the eye vision surgery can be effective without the supernatural working and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Here's what we're believing for. We are believing that the Holy Spirit is going to give you some new biblical spectacles so that you can begin seeing what God sees. If you want to see what God sees, put it in the chat and say, I want to see. Go ahead, write it in the chat right now. Just make that declaration over your life. I want to to see. So we're praying that we will begin seeing the God version of ourselves rather than the you version of ourselves. Family, every person, every one of us has a you living in you that you have never met. But I'm praying by the end of this sermon series, by the help and grace of the Holy Spirit, that God is going to introduce to you a God version of you that you have never met. Some of you today should should take a selfie of yourself. And you need to tell yourself, today, not tomorrow, not next Sunday, Today, everything in your life changes. Your vision is going to change because God is going to impart some truth into your life about eye vision. God is going to introduce to you a God version of you that you have never met. I'm praying that God is going to release fire of the Holy Ghost. I'm asking God, God, send us the fire of the Holy Ghost to purge self-hate. To purge low self-esteem. To purge that distorted viewpoint that has been planted in the soul and the mind of every believer that causes us to see incorrectly. Listen, listen carefully. Some of us need some serious deliverance. We need deliverance from low self-esteem. We need deliverance from failures, from anger, from offense, from resentment, from the deception and from the lies that the enemy has been feeding us for years, in some cases for a lifetime. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, For I say to the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, to think what? Soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. Notice here, family, that the Holy Spirit is warning us that we should never think of ourselves 
more highly than we should. But watch this now. To not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think doesn't mean that we should think of ourselves more lowly than we should. Because sometimes I feel like we Christians get this mixed up. We want to go around acting like, living our lives like we're just a worm in the dirt. But God never called you, anointed you, sent his son for you so that you can act like you're just a worm waiting for someone to put you on a hook to destroy your life. Notice the instruction. The instruction is to think soberly, to think soberly, to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man, what? The measure of faith. Sometimes our thinking becomes so intoxicated, our thinking becomes so messed up, and the word intoxicated actually means to be confused. Trust me on this. Life's pain, life's hurts, life's disappointments, life's rejections can cause the way you think and what you, dis- and what you see to become confused to become intoxicated. Some of us, our thinking is skewed. It's confusing. Now listen, I want you to know that my name is Dave and I really want to be your friend. I do. But it's time that we see ourselves through the eyes of God Rather than through the eyes of pain, hurt, failure, disappointment. See, discovering how to see what God sees is a powerful key in believing, which opens up the world of right living. In order to have a healthy eye vision, we must learn how to replace wrong beliefs with right beliefs based on God's word. Right believing always leads to right living. Now think about this. I'm just giving you the introduction to this sermon series. But think about Mark 8, 23. Mark 8, 23 and 24. Jesus now, in this text, he takes a blind man by the hand and leads the blind man out of the village, puts his hands on, or puts, puts, puts spit in his eyes, and then puts his hands on the man's eyes. And Jesus now asks this blind man a question. And the question is, do you see anything? Now, I want you to follow me on this. Jesus, do you see the scene? Jesus is healing the man. And then when he, when he does what he does by spitting in his eyes and touching his eyes, he says to the man, do you see anything? In other words, what do you see? And the Bible says, the man looked up and said, I see people. Hey, a blind man just a second ago couldn't see anything. But all of a sudden, with one touch from the master, he could now see people. Now, watch this. But then he says, they, the people, look like trees walking around. Now, family, stay with me on this. This right here is where most Christians get stuck. Right there is where many Christians get stuck because Christians right there begin to say, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but thank God 
at least I'm not where I used to be. And that sounds so good, doesn't it? But here's my challenge. What if seeing better doesn't help you to see clearly? Well, praise the Lord, at least I can see. But what if seeing is not enough? See, Jesus says to the man, in my words, Jesus basically says, listen, dude, I'm glad that you can see better. But improvement is not the goal. The goal is to see clearly. The man says, I see men as trees walking. So you know what Jesus does? Jesus says, come over here again. Because you seeing better is still not you seeing clearly. And church, I wonder how many people see better, but you're still not seeing clearly. Family, I'm so thankful for this scripture in Mark chapter 8. Because this story is proof that sometimes one touch is not enough. Now, I know that's challenging for, for, for us religious people who, who, you know, oh, if I could just get one word, if I could just get one touch, if I could but touch the M of his garment and all of that. But this gives me hope and makes me realize that sometimes one touch is not enough. This tells me that one prayer is not enough. Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, one deliverance is not enough. Sometimes one touch is not enough to make you see clearly. The blind man could see, but he couldn't see clearly. And some of us can see better, but we still don't see the way that God sees The man could see better, but his view was distorted. See, when I was watching, tried to watch that movie when I forgot my 3D glasses, I could watch the movie. I could hear the movie. But the picture was distorted. So I want you to get this. I don't want you to be part of the Resurrection Center so that you could see better. I'm looking that God will heal your vision, your eye vision. I'm really not interested in looking for a fixed up version of an old you. I'm looking for a new you where old things are passed away And behold, all things are becoming new. I'm not interested in just seeing better. I want to see clearly. Someone said, I have a viewpoint. You have a viewpoint. But God has a view. And I'm asking today in the mighty name of Jesus, on the first Sunday of this new sermon series called I Vision. I'm asking that the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come into our individual homes, come into our individual lives, come to our individual ch- uh, church, come, come in and into our corporate church and change our vision. Do you remember a time in Mark chapter 3 when Jesus sees a man with a withered hand. See, when Jesus looked at that man, he didn't just see a man with a withered hand. He saw the man's hand totally and completely healed. And when the man did what Jesus asked him to do, which was what? Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now watch this. When Jesus said, stretch out your hand, 
the man's hand was completely healed and restored. The reason is Jesus would have never asked the man to stretch out his hand if Jesus didn't already see what the man could not see. If, he didn't all, if Jesus didn't already see what the man could not see, he would have just saw the man's hand shriveled up without having the capacity to stretch it out. See, oftentimes, you just see your disability. You see your inadequacies. You see your disability, but when Jesus comes on the scene, he has the ability to see with, what, with, with eyes that you cannot see. When Jesus comes on the scene, he sees what cannot be seen with E-Y-E vision. Write this down. Jesus always sees what can't be seen. Come on, write it down. Jesus always sees what cannot be seen. See, you see, I see my brokenness. I see my dysfunctional hand. But Jesus sees a hand that is completely whole. You see your broken, dysfunctional, messed up life. But Jesus, he sees you completely whole. We see through our disabilities, our inadequacies, our dysfunctions, our victimizations, but God doesn't see you like that. He sees, God sees us through the blood and through the power of his might. See, anyone can see Paul in you. I mean, sorry, anybody can see Saul in you, but not everyone can see the Paul in you. Anyone can see the doubting Thomas in you, but only Jesus can see the Denimus in you. Anyone can see Abram, which means high father, but only God can see Abraham, which meant father of multitudes. Anyone can see Sarai, which means my princess, but not everyone can see Sarah, which meant the mother of nations. Anyone can see Jacob in you, which meant deceiver, supplanter, but only God can see the Israel in you, which meant the prince of peace or having power with God. When God changed a person's name and gave him a new name, he usually established a new identity. See, some of you don't realize it yet, because you're still in this process of being formed, but God is making you into something, into something beautiful. Look at Jeremiah 18, verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. See, God might have not even be the God that's going to use the talent that you see. Because here's what I've discovered, ladies and gentlemen. Oftentimes, we see the one talent that we feel that God gave us. But I've learned in my own life and by watching so many others that the one talent that you have might not even be the one talent that God is going to use. He might use the one talent that you don't even know that you have. Watch this. When God anointed Gideon, he turned a baker into a warrior. When God anointed Moses, he turned a shepherd into a national leader. When God anointed Amos, he turned a farmer 
into a prophet. When God anointed David, he turned a shepherd boy into a king. When God anointed Nehemiah, he turned a simple cupbearer into a city builder. When God anointed Peter, he turned a fisherman into a foundational stone upon which Christ would be established. When God anointed Paul, he turned a Christian killer into an apostle. When God anointed Joseph, he turned a prisoner into a prince. When God anointed Simeon, he turned a gang member into a disciple. When God anointed men like D.L. Moody, he takes a shoe salesman and turns him into an evangelist. When God anointed Charles Finney, he took a lawyer and turned him into the world's finest preacher. My question to you today is this. Who is the you that you have never met? Who is the you that you have never met? See, when you study the life of Jesus, you will learn that Jesus always sees what we cannot see. Jesus always sees what cannot be seen. Jesus had this incredible way of seeing what was going on on the inside of a person while others could only see what was going on on the outside of a person. I'll prove it to you. In the book of Matthew chapter 9, we see here four crazy friends ripping up the roof, roof of a house to, lo to lower down a paralyzed man. But Jesus didn't see that. What Jesus saw was their faith. So when I read Matthew 9, I see a man in need of physical healing. But because Jesus doesn't see what we see, Jesus didn't just see a man in need of a physical healing. He saw a man who was in need of having his sins forgiven. In Matthew 9, verses 34, 3 to 4, I would not have noticed anything about the scribes, but Jesus, if you read it, says, Jesus saw their evil thoughts. In verse 9, I would simply see a political traitor to the people, but Jesus, no, no, no. What Jesus, he didn't see a political traitor. Jesus saw a disciple. In verse in, in verses uh, 10 and 13, in the same chapter, chapter 9 of Matthew, I would have saw what the Pharisees saw. I would have saw Jesus eating with a bunch of sinners. But Jesus didn't see a bunch of sinners. What Jesus saw was some spiritually sick people who needed healing, and he leads them to repentance. In verse 20 to verse 22, I would have seen an unclean woman brushing up against my master, but not Jesus. Jesus saw her secret sickness and her faith, what makes her whole. Listen to me very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. In verse 23 through, to, through verse 25, I would have seen a dead girl, but not Jesus. Jesus sees a sleeping girl because Jesus never sees what we see. He always sees more. In verse 36 of the same chapter, I would have seen the crowd harassing my master, and I would be hoping that they would just go away so I could spend some more quality time with Jesus, but not Jesus. Jesus saw them as people. Who were, who were being harassed, and sheep, like sheep, like scattered sheep, who had no shepherd. So Jesus has compassion on them. Family, oh, to God, that he would give us the grace 
and the eye vision to see what he sees. Let me ask you this question. Do you see the people around you as burdened or just a burden? Do you see the generation around you as white unto harvest or a wasted harvest? Do you see the you version of yourself or the God version of yourself? See, just because you cannot see Jesus working on your case doesn't mean that Christ is not working. Just because you can't see Jesus' hands moving doesn't mean that Jesus' hands aren't moving. Just because you can't see Jesus' feet walking, it doesn't mean that Jesus' feet is not walking. Just because you can't hear him talking doesn't mean that he's not talking. Sometimes rejection is God's redirection. Sometimes disappointments are simply God's way of saying, I've got something more for you. Ladies and gentlemen, man says, show me and I will trust you. But God says, trust me and I will show you. Eugene Patterson said this, The way of Jesus cannot be imposed or mapped. It requires an active participation in following Jesus as he leads us through sometimes strange and unfamiliar territory. In circumstances that become clear only in the hesitation and the questioning, in the pauses and the reflections where we engage in prayerful conversation with one another and with him. Listen to me, family. Jesus sees differently than you and me. That's why we need to go back to the word of God and we need to learn to see what he sees. When Jesus sees a disease, when Jesus sees lack or someone trapped in fear, in guilt, in addiction, in shame, in low self-esteem, and even in sin. He doesn't see the problem. He sees healing. He sees grace. He sees mercy. He sees wholeness. He sees completeness. He sees the power abounding in that area of weakness. When we look at ourselves, we see our inadequacies our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our sin, our flaws, our brokenness, our distorted eye vision. But when God looks at us, he sees the blood. When Jesus sees us, when God sees us, he sees an image of himself. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of his likeness. God, he created male and female. He created them. And listen to what John 1, 2 says. Yet to all who do not receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Family, in the beginning of time, way back in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve are deceived by the serpent and they ate of the forbidden fruit, for the first time in their lives, they come to the realization that they were naked. Now watch this. What is the first thing that they do 
after they realized they were naked. No, no, no. The first thing they didn't do, they, they didn't go hide first. If you read the scriptures, the first thing that they did after they realized that they were naked was they went and they began to sew fig leaves together to make garments to cover themselves. And when God comes in the cool of the evening, as it was his daily custom, to have fellowship with them, he calls them, and he asks them in verse 9, he says, where are you? Now, I want you to get this. I want you to see this. I want you to see Adam hiding behind a tree. And God says, hey, where are you guys? And Adam is peeking out from behind the tree. And he says, I heard you coming. And I didn't want you to see me naked. So I hid. Now watch this. God asked them a question. Family, <laughs> watch. have you ever experienced this? I know I have before. Have you ever walked, you know, maybe you were away from your family a little while or you were out doing something and then the kids were home and you walk back into the house and all of a sudden, maybe your spouse, maybe your children, they were acting a little strange. And it's like, wait a sec. Something's not right here. So you start asking questions, right? You start asking like, hey, what's going on? I just feel like something is off. And you know, you, you know, especially the ladies, mothers can always tell when something shifts. Now, we know that God already knew what happened in the garden. But isn't it interesting, even though God knows what happened in the garden, he's still asking the question. He says, why are you hiding? And who told you that you were naked? Think about it. God is saying, wait, wait, time out. Damn, time out, Adam. Something's off. Something's not right. Adam, Adam, why are you acting strange? Because think about it. From the day I formed you, the day I planted you, the day I created you, you never one time told me that you were naked. Something changed. And God says, God says, have you eaten fruit from the tree that I warn you about? And the family, look again at the question found in verse 10 as I close this teaching today. God says to Adam, Adam, who told you that you were naked. Now here's what the Holy Spirit directed me to ask you. Who told you that God doesn't love you? Who told you that you weren't worth saving. Who told you? Who told you that God would never forgive you? Who told you that you would never be made whole? Who told you, ladies and gentlemen, that God would never bless you? Who told you that you would never be free from depression, from anxiety, from fear? Who told you? Who told you that no one would ever love you? Who told you that faith in God was good for others? 
but not good for you. Who told you that you would never be healed and you would never fully recover from the sexual abuse that you've been through? Who told you? Who told you that no one would ever marry or love you? Who told you that? Who told you that your children will always be messed up and will never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Who told you that your relationships could never be healed? Who told you that it was your fault that people mistreated you? Who told you to blame someone else for the way that you are? Who told you that God's would never use you. Who told you that God is disappointed with you? Who told you that you have crossed the line and his grace is no longer enough for you? All I want to know is who told you? Who told you that it's your fault that your parents abandoned you? Who told you that you weren't worth loving? Who told you that you could never be successful? Who told you that you could never open the business? Who told you that your family would be better off without you? Who told you that? Somebody is lying, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody lied to you. Somebody lied to me. So many times in my life, I've asked questions like, why do you act like that? Why did I say that? Why am I so afraid? Why am I, why am I struggling the way that I, I'm struggling? Why am I so insecure and annoyed when such and such a person is around me? Why is it that I'm so easily depressed when certain things happen? Why does people think, why does what people think of me matter so much to me? Why is it so important to me that everyone thinks that I'm a hard worker, that I'm a good husband, that I'm a good parent? Why is it important that everyone thinks that I'm smart, rich, successful, sexy, or spiritual? Why? Who told me? Why is my, why is my sexual identity so confusing? Why was I born? Why did my parents leave me? Why am I so broken? Why am I so messed up? Why do I keep doing or thinking the same thing over and over and over? Why does my relationships fail the way they fail? Here's what I believe. The reason why we go through all this craziness is because of a distorted I vision. If we can get our vision fixed, everything in our lives are going to change. This has been proven over and over and over again. Ladies and gentlemen, when we begin to see properly, when we begin to see the way that God sees, we will stop seeing through the filters of our enemies, through the filter of pain, through the filter of disappointment, and we will start to begin to say, I'm somebody in Jesus, that he thought that I was worth saving. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, Imagine myself, yourself, broken. The person that says to you in that mirror, mirror that you're disgusting and that you're useless. And Jesus says, I thought that you were worth saving. So I came, I lived, and I died. The next time... Somebody starts lying to you. The next time that you hear that voice, 
You need to remember this song. Simona, if, if somebody can help me sing that song, you don't want me trying to sing that song. But somebody today needs to hear this song again. That he thought that I was worth saving. Broken, useless, dysfunctional. Don't have things all together. But he thought, come on out. But he thought, listen, he thought I was worth saving. See, you, <laughs> some of you, you didn't think I was worth saving. And I'm so thankful that he never asked for permission from you to save me. But instead, he reached real low, picked me up, dust me off, and said, regardless of your brokenness, regardless of the, your resentment, regardless of your pain, you were worth saving. Somebody needs to hear that. Come on, Simona, lift it up one time for us. Yes. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was working. So you cleaned me up and it's time you thought I was to die for. So you sacrificed your life so I can be free, so I can be whole, so I can tell Come on. You got to tell yourself first. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you cleaned me up inside. You thought I was to die for. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. 